here just to rehash things for you is the cyclopentane example. Here again is the idea that even though cyclopentane has nearly ideal bond angles, it still has that element of ring, of, uh, ring strain in it, and that comes from eclipsing strain. So on this slide, you can see in concrete terms that that 6.5 kilocalories per mole corresponds exactly to eclipsing strain. Here we have essentially no ring strain associated with the molecule. So it's all eclipsing strain, and that's worth about 6.5 kilocalories per mole. We can determine that experimentally by comparing the stability of open chain pentane to the stability of cyclopentane. All right, so in the last few minutes here, I wanted to take a look at a strain-free cycloalkane. So there is a cycloalkane that has neither eclipsing uh, nor angle strain due to non-ideal angles. And that compound is cyclohexane. So you might look at cyclohexane and see the 120 degree angles. So cyclohexane is a regular polygon. And you might see the 120 degree angles and say, well, it looks to me like there should be some angle strain in that molecule because it's fairly far from the ideal bond angles of 100, 109 degrees. And I would say, fair enough. And you might also look at how we draw it in two dimensions on paper with wedges and dashes to represent 3D and say, well, if the ring is flat, then the two hydrogens that are next to each other should be eclipsing one another. So we should also have eclipsing strain in there. So you might pre predict something like 10 or 15 kilocalories per mole of destabilization of cyclohexane relative to open chain hexane. However, in doing that, you would be incorrect. The reason why is because cyclohexane in three dimensions has the ability to pucker up. So imagine taking this ring and pushing that carbon down into the plane of the screen and bringing the bottom carbon up out of the plane of the screen. So bringing the bottom carbon up out of the plane of the screen. As a result, we kind of pucker the ring a little bit and we can alter the bond angles by moving those carbons in three dimensions so that we end up with a structure that has ideal bond angles, and it looks like this. So what you can see from this picture is that all of these bond angles are 109.5 degrees, and they are all perfectly staggered. There's no eclipsing strain in there whatsoever, so we do not worry about eclipsing strain for cyclohexanes. This structure has an infamous history in organic chemistry. Thousands of students over the years have drawn this. It's called the cyclohexane chair, and in the next couple of slides I'm going to take you through a quick introduction to how to draw the chair. So there's the chair. We see it's got no strain at all whatsoever, fully staggered, perfect bond angles. But because of this puckering, it introduces some interesting stereochemical problems, right? So because of the puckering, what happens is the, the two hydrogens one pointing up straight up and down, the other kind of angled, are actually different stereochemically. So a compound with a substituent here could be a stereoisomer to a compound with a substituent here. So knowing how to draw and understanding how to draw those substituents is critical. So let's go to that right now and practice drawing chair cyclohexates. So a lot of methods have been devised for this process over the years, but I think the one that works best for me is this idea of drawing parallel lines. So keep in mind the ultimate structure we want to get to looks like this. And if you're just starting out, it can be difficult to see how to draw that quickly and easily. I think the easiest way is to take parallel bonds in the cyclohexane ring and draw them together. So let's start with, say, this bond right here in the upper left. Drawing that like this, then let's move to the parallel bond straight across from it and draw it exactly parallel, like that. Now let's move to a bond next to where we started. We can draw that in this sort of V shape. And then we draw a corresponding parallel bond for the other bond across from it, right here. And to do that, we kind of bring the lower V back on itself, like so. And then the final step is to connect to make the remaining two connections, and the result is a chair cyclohexane. To draw in the two kinds of substituents, remember we have the straight up and down substituents, and we have the sort of pointing outward substituents. To draw those, simply draw straight, straight lines up and down for the first kind, 
and to decide on which direction to draw up or down, just look at the direction of the point of that carbon. So this point is pointing upward, for instance, so we draw it going up. To draw the other kind of substituents, which are pointing outward, draw those parallel to the bond that is two bonds away. So for instance, this bond here that I'm bolding is two bonds away from this carbon. So the substituent pointing outward, or the equatorial substituent here, would be drawn in this direction. Doing that for all the rest of the carbons gets us to a structure like this. And this is the chair cyclohexane. And as I just mentioned, notice that the two kinds of positions, the equatorial and the axial, are energetically and stereochemically distinct. So next time, we're going to look at the conformational dynamics of cyclohexane, how it can change and how this structure undergoes changes in solution to interconvert the axial and equatorial positions and really introduces some interesting stereochemistry into the cyclohexane ring. But for now, that's all I have for today. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you next time.